Selamat pagi, selamat sejahtera. Good morning and welcome to everyone to Warm Malaysia. Welcome to the Malaysia SDG webinar on Malaysia's sustainable development, the decade for action, not inaction. <laughs> This webinar event is a joint collaboration between the Jeffrey Sachs Center and the Asian Strategy and Leadership Incorporated called ASLI. My name is Raymond Navratnam and I will be your moderator for this morning's exciting webinar for better or for worse. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to extend my congratulations to the working team both from ASLI and JSC for their hard work and dedication into putting this webinar together. This is the first one we are organizing, so there are some teething problems bear with us. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, SDSN, has launched the Sustainable Development Report 2020. While Malaysia recorded modest improvements in its ranking, from 66th position in 2019 to 60th position in 2020 out of 166 countries. Its main challenges remain in our country and we are here to confront them. This virtual event therefore has convened prominent thought leaders on the various aspects of Malaysia's sustainable development journey. They will offer insights on opportunities and challenges and action especially to achieve the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Yes, the theme is we need more action. Before we begin, just a reminder to adhere to the webinar etiquette, which I'm also learning. Each speaker will be given 15 minutes and we have a time people here who uses the guillotine. So be, be careful, be cautious. And secondly, kindly mute your microphone when others are speaking, like I do that to my wife. <laughs> the question and answer session will be at the end of all presentations. This audience is invited to post your questions at any time on this platform. We may not be able to answer all of them, but rest assured, we will select the most interesting one. Please ensure that your questions are direct, short, and sweet. I can't guarantee all will be entertained, but here we got Karen and Prava, who are the executioners. So if you don't have your question answered, blame them, not me. I would now like to welcome Tansri Dato Sri Dr. Jeffrey Chia, the founder and chairman of the Sunway Group, as well as the chair of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, SDSN, in Malaysia, to deliver his welcome remarks. Country. Good morning. Welcome to this webinar, Charting Malaysia's Path Towards Achieving the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. I am very grateful to Yang Prohamad Datu Sri Mustafa Mohamad, Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Economic Affairs for joining us today. I would also like to thank our distinguished panel of speakers representing the government, academia and the civil society. I look forward to your insights on the wider action needed for Malaysia to achieve the SDGs. Today's discussion comes at a relevant time. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought into sharp focus the major challenges facing the world and the threats to our future. And as we seek to recover from the impact of this virus to lives and livelihoods, it is pertinent to ask if the recovery will be accompanied by reform. I am certain that you will agree with me that we need to hit the reset button going forward. 
the systems, structures and policies that govern our yesterdays will not be as effective in shaping our progressive tomorrows. The good news is that the path towards this transformation has already been mapped out for us. The 17 SDGs serve as a holistic global vision towards building a better world. However, despite their worldwide adoption, the SDGs are still largely perceived to be aspirational. The COVID-19 crisis offers a genuine opportunity to repair and rebuild our societies and our planet. Sunway's own embrace of the SDGs is reflected in our track record, which has now been endorsed by the United Nations. The UN Sustainable Development Solution Network recently selected Sunway City KL as one of its three centres to oversee continent-wide sustainable initiatives. New York City will oversee the Americas, the, while Paris will look after Africa and Europe. And Sunway City Kuala Lumpur will be responsible for the whole of Asia. We are indeed very honoured and humbled by this recognition of our commitment to the Sustainable Development Agenda. In the context of today's webinar, our contribution to this mission is driven by a recognition that realising the SDGs is not the sole responsibility of the government. It requires the commitment of all sectors of society, the private sector, academia, civil society and of course every single individual. We are all in this together. Thank you. Richard, you have provided an inspiring speech, but you only don't make speeches, you show action. And Sunway City is a classic example of a sustainable city. Um, I now have the honor to invite uh, my old colleague, actually, but now he's minister and I'm not. Dato YB Dato Sri Mustafa Mohammed, the minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Economy, to deliver his ministry. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, okay. and a very good day, everyone. Firstly, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words at this very important event. I commend the organizers, ASLI, the Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable Development at Samu University, and the Malaysian chapter of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network for convening this virtual gathering on Malaysia's journey towards achieving the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sustainable Development Report 2020 was recently launched by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. I'm very pleased to know that Malaysia's ranking has moved up from number 66 in the year 2019 to number 60 this year out of 166 countries. A modest improvement, but there is of course much room for improvement. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a time of great change with the daunting economic challenges brought forth by the COVID-19 pandemic. The SDGs have become an even more critical component for Malaysia's future development. The upcoming 12th Malaysia Plan will further embed the SDGs into our five-year development plans, along with the Shared Prosperity Vision 2030. We'll also intensify efforts to ensure that Malaysians understand the importance of achieving SDGs in improving the quality of our life and accomplishing sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, we are committed to intensify our efforts on this ambitious journey of SDGs. I would like to call upon all Malaysians from the private sector, NGOs and individuals to be aware of our shared responsibilities. Government alone, of course, cannot achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. 
to leave no one behind. We need partnerships, resources and innovation. We must work together to shape a better, more equal and more sustainable future for everyone. I'm counting on your continuous and strong support. I'm sure today's eminent panel will come up with constructive and pragmatic recommendations. I welcome these ideas and hope that we can all strive forward collectively in building a sustainable and better Malaysia for everyone. Thank you. On behalf of the JSC and ASLI, I would like to thank you, sir, for your very insightful speech. It gives us a great deal of confidence, and you can be assured that the people of this our country will rally around your sterling call to work together. I am sure that JSC and ASLI will collaborate closely with the government and its officials and yourself, sir, to achieve the Agenda 2030. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we proceed to the presentations by our esteemed panelists. We have with us, as you can see on the screen, four distinguished experts. They are highly capable in their own right. First, is Dr. Zonika Mohammad, Deputy Director General Macro of Economic Planning Unit of the Prime Minister's Department. She is also a member of the SDSN Malaysia Leadership Council. Second, we have Ms. Lavinia Ramaya, Head of Policy and Climate Change, WWF Malaysia. She is a lawyer, but she has got an MSc in Sustainable sustainability, concentrating on climate change. Thirdly, we have Professor Dato Dr. Wu Wing Tai. He is highly accomplished and well known to the academic world and beyond. He is a distinguished professor of economics at the University of California in Davis and research professor at Sunway University here in Kale. He also heads the Jeffrey Chia Institute of Southeast Asia and the Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable Development. He is everywhere. He holds academic appointments at Fudan University in Shanghai, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Beijing, as well as Penang Institute, his old hometown. Finally, we have Professor Dato Dr. Mazlin Mokhtar, he is currently director at the Institute of, for Environment and Development, formerly called Lestari, very musical, and a member of the SDSN Leadership Council. He is also a member of the SDSN Malaysia Leadership Council. And that, with that, we go on to the presentation. <coughs> I would now like to invite Dr. Zunika to deliver a presentation on national directions of SDGs. Dr. Zorika. Uh, the moderator for today's webinar, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good morning to everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to extend our appreciation uh, to the organizers of today's event, the SDSN Malaysia, Jeffrey Sash Center, as well as ASLI for uh, successfully um, making this event uh, um, realized today. My presentation today, uh, basically, I will be focusing on three uh, main aspects of how Malaysia um, embark on the journey for SDG. Um, basically, uh, in terms of how the implementation of SDG in Malaysia, the monitoring and evaluation, and as well as some issues and challenges that we are facing uh, right now. Uh, in terms of, can we go to slide seven? Yeah, more, 
forward next 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 let's let's move the okay next next okay um basically i'll go straight to the um how we embrace sdg in malaysia <clears throat> as we all know malaysia's development has always been geared towards sustainable development uh, which take taken into account economic social and environmental perspective uh, therefore it was seamlessly easier for the government uh, to embed sdg into our national development uh, game changing holistic policies since 1991 uh, if we notice introduced the concept of a more balanced and cohesive development akin to the SDGs, uh, making it easier to align national objectives with the SDGs. Uh, for instance, if you look at these slides, um, our first uh, long-term uh, economic policy, the new economic policy, actually had focused on growth with equity for national unity, of which uh, embedded inside it is inclusive development, uh, looking at eradication of poverty irrespective of ethnicity and also uh, looking at restructuring of the society and follow through from that is national development policy of which look into a more balanced development uh, from a multi-dimensional approach uh, including safeguarding the environment and later on, the national vision policy uh, for the period of 2001 to 2010 uh, focused on resilient and competitive nation. Underneath this long-term uh, policy was vision 2020 uh, for the period of 1991 to 2020, of which look holistically at the development aspect uh, focusing on not only economic, but also on political, social, spiritual, psychological, and culture. So um, in, in that nutshell, uh, in sustainable development actually is, is already inside our long-term policy development in Malaysia. And uh, currently we are looking at the uh, Shared Prosperity Vision 2030 launched uh, last year. And this long-term policy also uh, embedded inside it the restructuring the development priorities of Malaysia. Okay, we go to the next slide. Uh, this is what we foresee that uh, in, in terms of the long-term, uh, the medium-term policy, the long-term policy, uh, looking at sustainable development goals, we have social environment and economy. And in our new economic model, we have inclusivity, sustainability, and high income. And going into 11 Malaysia plan, we have anchoring growth on people as a team, uh, while the midterm review of the 11 plan, looking at new priorities and emphasis. All of these actually are um, part and parcels of the SDGs. Okay, next uh, slide. Um, this is the shared prosperity. It's, it's look very small. Um, everybody can have a look at it. Um, it's available online. Uh, we can you, you can just download this document for your reference. Um, next slide actually is uh, looking at how um, in terms of the governance of implementing the SDG, um, in order to oversee the implementation, monitoring and reporting of the SDGs, uh, Malaysia has established a governance structure comprising all stakeholders headed by the National SDG Council, chaired by YAB Prime Minister. Uh, we are looking forward to have um, the first meeting uh, for our current Prime Minister uh, sometimes. Uh, this year if possible and the council sets the national agenda and monitoring for implementation of sdg at national level and report to the united nation hlpf and this council is supported by the steering committee uh, chaired by the director general of the economic planning unit of which coordinate as well as oversee the overall implementation of the sdgs and uh, in the next slides what i would like to highlight here is in terms of 
um, how we map the SDG into our uh, five-year development plan. Uh, under the midterm review of the uh, 11 Malaysia plan, we have um, pillars uh, to illustrate our focus area. And under each of these pillars, we map the 17 goals. As we can see here, um, all the 17 goals uh, are mapped out into these uh, pillars to ensure that all the 17 goals uh, got to be focused uh, while implementing the 11th Malaysia Plan. And under the um, Shared Prosperity Vision, SPV 2030, uh, of which uh, this SPV, as mentioned by the uh, Honorable Minister just now, uh, it has three um, development dimensions uh, as well. Economic empowerment, environmental sustainability, and social engineering. And uh, looking at the detail inside, uh, currently in terms of the shared prosperity uh, vision document, uh, we will not be finding a detail on the SDG. But when um, all when we map out the 12th Malaysia plan implementation against the um, shared prosperity vision, we will be laying out uh, more strategies and action items for implementation uh, uh, against these 17 goals as well. So, uh, in terms of financing for SDG, um, when we when the SDG was launched in 2015, uh, we realized that actually what we were doing uh, under our five-year development plan and our annual budget actually uh, has had, had take into account the majority of the SDGs uh, goal and uh, focus area. So when we uh, look at the financing aspect, um, we, we um, force, at, at that time, um, mapping the, the, the financing requirement for SDG actually is um, very smooth because um, in terms of the five-year national development plan, when we lay out the uh, development budget for our uh, strategies and um, initiative, uh, since we have met out, we, we, we say that uh, actually um, all the budget that we have allocated for national development actually at the same time goes to implementing SDGs. And uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, this slide, yeah. So uh, just to illustrate that in terms of development expenditure for the last five years, uh, we have, um, in terms of focusing area, we put uh, a total of um, about 45 to 50 uh, billion uh, ringgit Malaysia for the implementation of our development plan. And inside this budget actually is for in the implementation of um, SDGs in a broad sense. And um, in terms of uh, operating expenditure, we also say that because for instance, the uh, ministry responsible for environment, for uh, natural resources, their emolument will also goes to making sure that um, the SDG initiative got implemented. So these are some of the numbers in terms of the operating expenditure uh, that we, we can we can relate to the SDG implementation. And in the next slides, um, this is um, additional to the normal development expenditure. We also launched this green technology financing scheme uh, on the six months. March uh, 2019. Uh, this is uh, in terms of uh, this is the second time uh, GTFS 2.0, of which uh, targeted about two billion uh, ringgit Malaysia for the period of uh, January 2019 to 2020, 2020 um, which offer two percent interest rate uh, 
uh, or profit rate subsidy for the first seven years uh, with 60% government guarantee on the financing. And uh, besides that, we also have um, tax incentives for green technology. Um, looking at this uh, tax incentive, um, actually, um, it is a tax allowance uh, for the purchase of green technology assets. And we also have a green um, investment tax exemption um, for the use of green technology services and uh, systems. And besides that, we also have um, the promotion of investment act, um, looking at uh, renewable energy as well as energy efficiency. And um, the number that we have um, up to 2017, um, a total of 83 renewable energy projects um, with total investment of about 60, 653 million um, ringgit have been approved, uh, approved for tax incentive and promotion of investment act. And um, in terms of uh, other potential sources of SDG financing, uh, we find out that, um, as we also heard that, um, it's not just the responsibility of the government, but also the private sector. So um, we also um, captured uh, that private sector CSR program are also aligned to the SDG. And um, we also uh, got international sources uh, in terms of um, joint uh, project with uh, some uh, international bodies and also crowdfunding um, the potential of using a platform that can gather resources from the public uh, as well as social entrepreneurship uh, in encouraging uh, social enterprise to take up SDG related courses. Um, in, in terms of monitoring, um, we, uh, in 2017, we have presented our uh, Malaysia... Dr. Monica, I'm sorry to interrupt. You've got about two minutes. You've okay, got, all right. We're looking around here. Thank you. Thank you, Tansri. Uh, in terms of uh, monitoring, uh, these are the journey that we have taken in terms of implementing the SDG. And then uh, the next slide, please. Okay, uh, we have presented our report, uh, a voluntary report in 2017, looking at the implementation of uh, measure to eradicate poverty. And then uh, in terms of um, data and monitoring, we also have um, the Department of uh, Statistic Malaysia in cooperation with UNCT Malaysia. We have developed a system to assess and keep track of the SDG progress. So right now, in terms of uh, the indicators, we are monitoring 244 indicators, of which 118 are available. Um, there are works to be done for the rest of the indicators to ensure that we can keep track of all the, uh, the indicators of the, of the SDGs. And uh, next, uh, actually, is in terms of, um, as I said just now, we, um, Dossum has established this website of which we can um, access and look at the uh, how we track the SDG progress in Malaysia. And then uh, we can go straight to the issue. Can we go straight to the issue? Just um, to highlight in one minute that actually uh, we are facing issue as as the normal um, government uh, in terms of implementing uh, a challenge in reporting because not all private sector came forward to report what they are doing. And in terms of coordination, uh, funding, uh, and another thing that we we need to put more, more efforts actually is in terms of localizing. Uh, how do we... Uh, uh, cascade down the implementation of SDG to the local levels. This is a, a next step that we have to focus on. And of course, data. So, uh, Tansri, uh, I think that's all that I can share uh, with the uh, in, in, in this today's event in terms of the implementation of SDG from the perspective of government. Thank you, Tansri. Thank you very much, Masi and uh, Dr. 
Runika Mohamad for your comprehensive presentation. I'm impressed that you say we have all along been incorporating some sustainability issues from the NEP. I'm also struck by the fact that you want to monitor it. I hope in the end, policies are important, but implementation is very valid and relevant. And that monitoring this time will be stronger and that the public will be invited to participate in the monitoring, as you said, even at the local government level. Yes. You know, we don't have local elections, so sometimes there's a problem of expression. But maybe these things will be taken into account. Thank you very much again. Uh, now I will call upon Ms. Lavinia Ramaya to deliver her presentation on environmental action. Her father, the late country Ramaya, was involved in a lot of this, and I'm sure she's carrying on her father's legacy. Yeah, Lavinia. Your voice can't be heard. Uh, can you put it on to unmute? Please? Unmute. Press your unmute button. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Now it's good. I'm trying to. Earlier, I could start, uh, share my slides, but now I'm not able to do so. I don't know how. From beginning. Uh, can you see my slides? Like no, we can't, uh, Lavanya. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Unless it's with the wild wildlife. <laughs> uh, I don't know why it's not. Oh, okay. Now. Okay. Um. Can she be helped along? Okay. Can you see it now? Can you see? Uh, now I see. Okay. Now I do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, really a big pleasure for, uh, for us to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting WWF to be part of this esteemed panel, moderated by a notable veteran in nation building, Pansri Raymond. And it is indeed timely. And I am going to focus on the environmental pillar in, in my presentation today. So as you can see, the environmental pillar is actually covered by these uh, mainly by these six uh, goals, goal six, seven, 13, 14, 15, and 12. And uh, this is as defined by EPU and you heard from uh, Dr. Zunika just now on how we are institutionally approaching SDG implementation in the country. So I will be focusing on these goals. But really, I hope to leave you with the appreciation that the goals are in fact indivisible and nature is cross-cutting and underpins the achievement of all the goals. What we do need is a strong foundation upon which society can thrive and build a viable economy. And we all rely on nature for that strong foundation. So you can see here, there was a report by ITBES um, which was actually the first chair was Tansri Zakri, our former science advisor. And in that report, it says that many of the SDGs are very fundamentally reliant on ensuring uh, on biodiversity and ecosystems being protected. So allow me today to touch on these areas. Along the way, I will be quoting from an article I read recently in the Star, which extensively cited Tansri Jeffrey Chia's vision for how we should reset ourselves in this post-COVID unprecedented era. So in the SDG report, it says SDGs were adopted to address unnecessary risks and fragilities across economic, social, and environmental domains. So we'll see how Malaysia's environment, environmental performance is in the report. And we look at some challenges, the implications of those challenges, opportunities, and also the way forward. So in terms of performance, as you can see, Malaysia is part of the East and Southeast Asia region. And in terms of the SDG scores, 
we have actually we are in a region which has performed below the global average on most of the environmental goals save one which is goal 13 on climate action and for malaysia itself this slide shows the trends uh, in terms of the arrows and the rating for malaysia so from here we can see that although overall we have improved moderately on goal six there remain significant challenges for goal 11 on sustainable cities and communities, we see an improving trend, but, to, but, but also challenges remain. And on goals 13, 14, and 15, we have been stagnating and face significant, and in the case of life on land, goal 15, major challenges, which is shown in red. While on con sustainable consumption and production, there is no trend data available, but we are rated as facing significant challenges. Really, the only place where we see a bit of green that's on track or maintaining SG achievement is on goal seven. But here again, we still face challenges. So what are some of these challenges? I think this quote captures it very well from Sansri Jeffrey. But I believe a major factor is our obsession with unbridled growth, as measured by the metric known as gross domestic product GDP. So what does so that is an overarching challenge, but specifically in terms of environment, let me uh, here highlight a few challenges in terms of policy and enforcement and also the approach we often adopt. And it's not just us, across the globe. We take a silo approach in addressing a lot of things. So in terms of policy, in some instances, we are actually not fully reaping the benefits from efforts we have already been undertaking. For example, we have kept our forest cover at above 50% since the pledge we made in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit. And a recent WWF analysis shows that more than 48% of that is actually under legislation. So surely to meet that at least 50% goal, we can legislate the remaining about 2% and transform this pledge really into a strong policy and also create a framework to realize it, enabling the participation of all corporates, communities, CSOs, academics to reap these benefits. The other policy I'd like to highlight or the lack of is in terms of governance of our marine area. You know, our, govern our marine area is actually greater in area than terrestrial area. Yet, we don't have a comprehensive policy which we can use to govern our oceans. So this is again something that's missing. And the third is carbon pricing, it's something that we should really be looking into strongly now so that the country can be prepared towards meeting our long-term goal of being a low carbon nation. In fact, the youth, when the, they were consulted in during the TN50 consultant, uh, consultations, wanted Malaysia to be a net carbon zero economy by 2050. So these are things we already need to start looking at now in order for the realization to happen well in the future. Now, in terms of enforcement, you know, we have this Hello, you can't be heard. Is there something wrong on your side or our side? Lavinia? Um, oh, why? Ah, now it comes out okay. okay. Somebody might have clicked the button. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, now you're okay. Okay, can you see my slide? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. good. Okay. So, yeah, I think we are all aware that, you know, the tigers, which is a national heritage, a national symbol, it's actually in a very critical level in terms of population. And you know, this means that we are uh, under, under risk of losing our national heritage. And also there's a security threat because there are a lot of foreign poachers that come in and, and come and poach our, our tigers. And fisheries also, there's a huge economic loss. And uh, this in turn leads to threat to food security. The third thing is silo approach. You know, as uh, Dr. Zunika mentioned, it's great to hear that, you know, the 12th Malaysia plan is uh, intending to break that down. But all this time, we've actually seen, you know, the environment, the economy and uh, society 
pretty much as Cedric Pillars. And so we really need to work towards um, breaking down those silos. And even across sectors, for example, in waste management, we have different agencies responsible for waste that is either in different media, for example, land or water, and that needs to also be resolved. So I mentioned fisheries just now. You can see here that VOF actually reported last year that we are losing about three to six billion annually due to illegal fishing activities, and that there has been a drastic decline in fish stocks compared to 1960 levels. 88% throughout Malaysia and up to 96% in Peninsular Malaysia. And globally, 90% is fully fish. So we are actually seeing... Uh, uh, Lavinia, I don't know why we don't get the slides shown on the screen. Oh. Is it, is it apparent there on your side? Yes, I can see it. Um, How okay. come you can see, I can't see? Uh, now, can you see it now? Uh, uh, is it share it on the screen. Can you share it on the screen? Uh, yeah, I was okay. Hang on. You were okay all this while? Yeah. Uh, something happened. I think it somehow. Okay. Now? Uh, now it's okay. Okay, I don't know what happened. Cut off on its own. Um, apologies. You mean some tiger is around from <laughs> WWF. That would oh, be yeah. good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so as you can see, actually we are you know facing a huge threat to food security as well in terms of loss of fishery resources globally as well as in Malaysia. So what are the implications? Again, let me quote Tansu Jeffrey Jeff. In the wake of the pandemic, fulfilling everyone's needs requires us to take a piercing look at ourselves as individuals and as a society. It calls for us to emphasize values such as compassion, empathy, tolerance, and inclusiveness. It demands more equitable outcomes in policymaking by governments and market operators by the private sector. So many times we are not quite aware of how nature features in this. Well, we now have a range of publications from IPDES, as I mentioned, which was you know, chaired by our former science advisor, Tansi Zakri, from the World Economic Forum, from UNAP, and they all assess the severity of nature's laws on the other two pillars of uh, the sustainable development, society and economy. WWF also has come up with several publications assessing this through different lenses from the macroeconomic perspective, in investment index, business and society risks. And this slide here shows you some of the many services that nature provides to people for our well-being, both socially and economically. In fact, we put a if we want to put a price on nature, it actually provides services to the global economy worth as an estimated 125 trillion per year, two thirds more than global GDP, which was at 75 trillion in 2016 through the supply of fresh air, clean water, food, energy, medicines, and other products and materials. And here, I mean, I don't need to dwell on this, but zoonotic diseases are due to our mismanagement of nature, as can be seen here. And the impact, of course, is very apparent to us as we are facing the COVID-19 situation. So, and according to World Economic Forum, you can see here that climate change and nature loss pose two of the biggest risks to people, to businesses. And this slide also shows you that biodiversity loss has in become increasingly important from 2018 to 2020. It's grown in its, in its uh, risk importance, both risk in terms of likelihood of happening and the impact of that risk. And this which is a recent WWF report shows economic outcomes in terms of, you know, if you continue along a business as usual trajectory versus a trajectory which has conservation in mind. We call it the global conservation and there are certain aspects that need to be met, which includes sustainable consumption and production, protection of nature, stabilization of land use, and peaking of greenhouse gases. So business as usual means we are in the red by almost 10 million in 2050 while the um, global conservation allows us to have an improvement compared to the baseline. 
And as you can see that all the other indicators are also red for the business as usual, BAU, and mainly green or an improved red for the VC scenario. And increasingly, investors are also looking for sustainable investment opportunities. And this report makes a recommendation on how Malaysia can attract such investors with the green bonds and so on. So it is a golden opportunity for us to do what is said here by Tan Sri Jeffrey, to move beyond what some have termed cowboy capitalism to compassionate capitalism and reset our trajectory. So what we can do is looking at... Lavinia, the, sorry, you got two minutes left. Okay, so you've already heard what the government's plans are. We have also a, a, a potential for collaboration. Let me just tell you about the APPGM SDG. This is a, a, a platform which is um, participated by many uh, MPs and, uh, the, and led by Dr. Denison Jayasurya of the CSO SDG Alliance. And there have been pilot studies that have been done. And as Dr. Zunika mentioned, this has been done to cascade down SDGs to local level. And um, I'm pleased to say that actually uh, Topa is also a member of this uh, APPGM SDG Alliance. And this afternoon, we're actually going to Jelly to his constituency to do the study on uh, in that area. Um, we also have an opportunity. We have, uh, uh, WWF has been running this uh, series of uh, collaborative calls to see what an economic shift could look like uh, with um, partners. Corporates also are playing a big role. As you can see, there's, there's this Climate Governance Malaysia initiative that is organizing a big showcase event during the Climate Week in New York. Uh, Bank Negara Malaysia has done many things, and uh, also CIMB has done uh, several summits, uh, already one last year and one coming up on the Cooler Earth Summit. So all this can move towards enabling us to um, meet our Agenda 2030 and our shared prosperity vision. And really, the vision could be to brand, create a branding for Malaysia as a sustainability first nation or a biodiversity friendly nation, something that we can all uh, work and gear ourselves towards. So way forward, inst instead of economies that need to grow, we need economies that make us thrive whether or not they grow. And these can be done through the, some of these interventions. First, a constitutional amendment to, a, uh, to embed a right to a clean environment. We should create enabling policies and frameworks that enable us to reap these benefits. I already mentioned, touched on some of these earlier. And we should adopt these principles in all of this, looking at the long term rather than short term, looking at holistic planning rather than silo, being purpose rather than profit driven, uh, having investments, looking at it uh, as um, you know whatever we do in terms of an investment into the future rather than a cost for, uh, at current day, looking at stakeholder rather than shareholder value generation, being collaborative and adopting a whole of nation approach, and making sure that in everything we do, we are not leaving anyone behind and ensure that there is transparency and accountability. So let me just leave you with a few of these, these last few comments. One thing that we should look at is the value that uh, nature can play. And given our attribute as a mega diverse nation, we should really harness nature-based solutions to meet various challenges and developmental uh, goals. And Malaysia can also and should also play a key role in ensuring we have a Savania, nature. Savania, your culture. time is coming to a close. Okay, one, one more minute. This includes domestic as well as global collaborative actions. We need a new deal for nature and people across various multi multilateral fora like the CBD, the UNFCCC and across our developmental agendas. So this is what I'd like to leave you with. My last slide, nature is essential for achieving the sustainable development goals. So I'd like to acknowledge, uh, you know, the quote which I took uh, for that I quoted Jeffrey Chair, uh, that's the Jeffrey Chair from, uh, is from the newspaper, The Star, and also my colleagues who helped with the presentation preparations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lavania. We, of course, are happy that you have drawn inspiration from country Jeffrey Chair, who, as you know, is in the forefront in the battle to bring about a more sustainable society, country, and world. Um, 
You talked about iron bridal growth, you quoted Councillor Jeffrey Chair. The, the secret, I think, is to be able to convince the public and the business community and government that there is a balance. It cannot be no growth. It cannot be optimal, maximum growth. There has to be a balance. And this, we look upon WWF to give more feedback to the government and to the people. And if you win the support of the public, the public can put pressure on government. So let's all work together. We are all in it together. I now come to Professor Dr. Dr. Wu Wing Tai to deliver his presentation on um, accelerating sustainable development. He says, Malaysia Bole. I like to see him put his hand up and punch the air. Malaysia Bole. Yes, Professor. We've been waiting for you. Prof, can we can't hear you? Okay. One minute, just give I, us a second. I, I was trying to make the point that I'm a man of few words. That's why I was uh, you couldn't hear me the first time. Uh, very I'm effective very words. So we're looking forward to listening to you. Oh, thank you. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, webinar. And uh, the first two presentations were exceedingly uh, uh, analytical, and they provided then they provided us a very comprehensive picture of the state of the planet. The fact that we today are and are communicating through the internet rather than in uh, an in-person uh, panel. It's a big reminder of that what we think as normal might well be a mirage uh, of, sustain of a sustainability that could not be preserved. So what the Sustainable Development Solutions Network have do has done in giving us an annual report is that it is meeting a basic need in people. I think that there's a basic desire in people for progress to occur, especially progress for their children. People might think that their own lives are worthless, but they certainly do not think that uh, of, the, of the lives of the children. So, what people really want to know is what is the state of the human condition and how resilient is it to shocks and how sustainable is this progress. The 17 SDGs provide the best available measure that we have of progress, which is a rather a difficult concept to grasp. But we can think of, pro we, we will agree that progress is characterized by having many dimensions. It's not only economic progress in terms of GDP per capita, it's progress in terms of having cleaner air and also by uh, greater uh, empowerment of uh, uh, people's rights, greater equality, and uh, responsible stewardship of the environment. So progress is a concept that involves many dimensions. But the, these dimensions are not independent of each other. There are sometimes trade-offs among them created by the fact by non-linear interactions amongst them. This is why the United Nations had expanded from the Millennium Development Goal, which had only eight objectives, to 17 objectives, the 17 SDGs, largely because eight was not enough 
to give us a good enough picture of what we want to know. But even then, 17 is not enough, 17 goals. That, and each of the goal has around 10 targets associated with it. So that's why we, there are 169 targets. Some of these targets are hard to define. They can at best be, we can get glimpse of how we are moving towards the targets. That's why many times we have more than two indicators for a, a given target, which results, has resulted in us having 232 indicators in order to know, to chart our way in our uh, journey of progress. The journey of progress is like flying an airplane. Have you ever seen a, co a cockpit with the many number of dials in front of it? This is what we are trying to do in the SDG uh, project. We are trying to move comprehensively across many dimensions. And this is why it is hard to have one measure of progress. We need a multiple of indicators. Well, Malaysia, I, as was pointed out by uh, uh, the first speaker, uh, Tan Sri Sunika, we have been making progress in sustainable development. Prime ministers have come and prime ministers have gone, but what has stayed is our commitment to the sustainable development of the country. Not a straightforward journey. Sometimes there are a few steps backwards temporarily, and uh, we have done well. Like for example, we are ranked number 60 in the 2020 report, an improvement from 66 in the previous report. In all the reports of SDSN, if you look at the top 10 countries versus the bottom 10 countries, what would we see? For the last six years, the top 10 countries have been countries located in Western Europe, particularly in Northern Europe, Norway, Sweden, uh, Denmark, Finland, and at the bottom, unchanged for the last six uh, times, are 10 of the poorest countries of the world, and they're all in Africa. So one thing we know is that if you have high income, you are more likely to be doing well in the sustainable development ranking because you are able to, you have the resources to spend on undertaking social protection, investing in quality education, and having a comprehensive health network. So being rich is helpful if one wants to, read, wants to uh, live a more balanced life. Well, so we know, so that, that's why the richest countries have always, uh, are, are, are the 10 most uh, highly ranked in terms of sustainable development. And the poorest countries are in the 10 lowest rank. Well, of course, being high income does not necessarily mean that you end up being ranked high in sustainable development. We are ranked number 60 and Singapore, which on a per capita basis is around three times that of Malaysia, is ranked 93. That shows that we have given much more attention to social inclusion, which income equality, and quality of the environment than Singapore on the average. In that sense, we can give ourselves a pat on our back. Well, we deserve a, a, a small pet, however, not a big pet, because we, we find that uh, Thailand, which has an income per capita of 50% lower than Malaysia, 
is ranked number 41. And Vietnam, which has only half the per capita income that we have in Malaysia, is ranked number 49. This goes on to make the point that how well, how, how well, how balanced uh, progress that one is making depends a lot on the effort that the country makes and not just on the amount of income that is available for the country to spend. So the achievements we have is marked by five areas of bad performance that was identified. The areas of unusually bad performance that SDSN the identified for Malaysia is in terms of hunger, in terms of health of the population, in terms of the gender, uh, the lack of gender equality in the country, and uh, we have not been making good progress on the reduction of inequalities on a number of other dimensions besides gender. And the fifth has to do with the sustainable use of the land in Malaysia. For example, the thing that they uh, draw particular attention to is the destruction of wildlife habitat in Malaysia, resulting in the uh, extinction, uh, raising the possibility of species extinction in Malaysia. Of these five things that were identified, I would like to focus on only one of them. I would like to focus on the issue of SDG 2, the issue of hunger. The fact that we are ranked so low on hunger, on, on zero hunger, was a big surprise to me. Because after all, we have practically zero absolute poverty in this country. Because we have practically zero uh, absolute poverty, it is surprising that we are doing poorly on SDG 2. Well, we are doing poorly on SDG 2 is because there were two indicators inside SDG 2 that make us rank so low. Specifically, the, we got a low rank on SDG 2 is because SDG 2 is about both hunger and nutrition. How well nourished are Malaysians? It is not a matter of have you eaten enough? The question is, have you eaten food that is good for your body? It turns out our low score is due to the prevalence of stunting in this country. Stunting means that given uh, is, is a question of are the people that we have at the potential height that they could that they should be having. In other words, is the population uh, achieving the height that they have the potential to achieve given the ethnic composition, given the DNA? In other words, given the height of the potential height, it turns out most Malaysians are not achieving their potential height. And this stunting shows no improvement over time. The second reason why our SDG2 score is so low is due to the prevalence of the phenomena of wasting. And what is wasting? Wasting refers to if you take the height of a person as given and you say, what weight should that person be at? You will find that a large, unusually 
large proportion of the Malaysian population has a weight that is lower for the given height. And we must remember the height that we have Actually, I'm fascinated by your talk, but uh, you got about two minutes, please. Okay, below the potential. So, and what is wrong with stunting is that it's associated with a higher death rate and a higher sickness rate and a lower IQ. And worse, it refers, it means stunted girls usually give birth to stunted children in the future. I have two minutes left. And do you know why I spend most of it in laying out the background? It's because everything I say, it can be said better by my colleague, Derek Kwok, Kwok in his article, Stunting in Malaysia cause, Causes and in, in a working paper that you can unload from our website. Let me quickly show you some of the findings that Derek has uh, brought to my attention, which more people should uh, be aware of. If you look at the upper middle income country of which Malaysia is a member, the average stunting rate is 6.9 for upper middle income countries. But there are a number of upper middle income countries that have stunting rates above 6.9, like Mexico, Iraq, Ghana, and Malaysia. This is surprising. The only thing that we have in common with Ghana is that we both achieved independence in the same year, 1957. But other than that, Ghana has half the income that Malaysia has. The only thing we have in, uh, that uh, we have in common with Iraq is we have a political war in Malaysia and Iraq has a physical war that is going on. So what we have in Malaysia is we have an unusually high rate of stunting for upper middle income country. And, not, and if you look at how we have done over time, the stunting in 2007 is the same as the stunting in 1997. We had some minor improvements and then we perk up to before. Basically, for 10 years, there be no change. Whereas for the world as a whole, world. the average has declined from 35 to 22. And this, the most amazing thing is the stunting is not just occurring in poor people. Oh, sir, I'm afraid I got to stunt your good speech. Okay, let me your time uh, stop is right up. here. This shows you that even the very rich in Malaysia, stunting, is 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 a phenomenon. What it means is stunting in Malaysia reflects a failure of the education system. When we teach people about food, we tell them what is the food that is acceptable for your religious group. But what we should also tell them the education on nutrition, not just food that is good for spirit for our spiritual self, but also for our physical self. This shows a failure in the education system that is quite fundamental. So we, in terms of uh, uh, program of moving the SDG uh, agenda along, this is an area which Malaysia has the income to solve. And we, and we should, that this is one I would call a low hanging fruit that we should plant in the near future. And we have I think uh, your, Derek Koch I think your, for bringing this to our attention. I'm done. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. I think you come out very well. And the point is Malaysia bully. Because it appears it's education, as you say rightly. And that doesn't need a huge lot of money. It just improves the syllabus and make sure the teachers and the students understand that they can eat, but eat the right food. Not all this fast food or just starchy and carbohydrates, which might look make a chap look good, but uh, he's really not strong. And what worries me is the mental capacity is affected. So the rural population, I suppose, if they don't know exactly, and the urban and the rural poor, 
they'll always be poor. So EPU will take note of this. I'm sure Topa will take note of this. And it's quite easy to remedy if you give it the spirit of Malaysia bully. Thank you, bro. That was very good. I'm afraid not well understood by our people yet. Now I would like to have a final say from that Professor Dato, Dr. Mazlin Mokta. His presentation will be on governance and decision making. That is vital. If the governance is poor, can have all the funds, it'll all be wasted. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Doctor. Thank you, Tan Sri. And uh, Salaamu Alaikum and very good morning to Tan Sri and the distinguished panelists. Good to see Professor Wu, Navanya, and Dr. Zunika again. And also to all the listeners who are get, getting connected to this webinar. First and foremost, thank you so much uh, uh, to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I, I would like also to acknowledge uh, at this juncture my colleague, uh, Associate Professor Lee kai -en, who has helped put together this brief presentation to facilitate, hopefully, our understanding. Uh, it's looking forward to the Decade for Action in terms of implementing SDG further. Presentation by Dr. Zunika was very interesting. Analysis by Lavanya and Professor Wu, fantastic. So let me just perhaps wrap up and uh, add more, uh, a few points here and there. If we look at the recent report of SDG 2020 performance for Malaysia, as uh, Professor Wu had uh, shown and Lavanya had shown, a bit surprising that Malaysia did not have any data for SDG number 10 and number 12. This is a bit worrying, especially coming from perspective of academia and researcher. So I would like to call upon uh, myself, my colleague and fellow researchers of universities in Malaysia, especially let's come forward and help our country to look at the data for uh, reduce inequality, responsible uh, consumption and production, eh? SDG number 10 and 12. We have, we have been reported as uh, information unavailable. So quite worrying here. So let's uh, back up and work together for this. And also quite sad to see that Malaysia is performing badly for SDG number 17, which is a partnership for the goals. So maybe like what Professor Wu had done by looking at our performance, which is quite shocking for SDG number two, when he zoomed in into the details of SDG two, then he dig out with his colleague the reasons why we are stagnating for SDG2. Surprising, Malaysians are well known to be <laughs> quite a good eater. We are well known to be one among one of the nations with a high percentage of obese people. So there you go, let's, let's see what we can do. But coming back to SDG17, surprising why Malaysia is performing badly in partnership. So we need to scrutinize the targets and among the 232 indicators that Prof Wu had mentioned, is it partnership among ourselves? Is it partnership between Malaysia and other countries? So many, I think it, it involves all. So there you go. In many conferences and webinar, and for many years we had been deliberating, we Malaysians are all quite well known. We will come forward when there is a disaster. Something bad happened, we come and work together. But during peaceful time, your data is my data, but my data is my data. We don't share. So we also discussed this yesterday at the launching of the, I was sharing this with Tan Sri earlier this morning, the Water Sector Transformation 2040, EPU. Uh, Dr. Zunika's colleague, uh, DDG, uh, Dr. Zunika's colleague, uh, DDG Azhar Norani, launched the official study to look and turn the water sector into an important sector for Malaysia, an important sector of GDP by 2040. That means that is a special sector that will be scrutinized upon jobs creation and all that. Hence, it will have a good bearing on perhaps uh, SDG 6. We are reported as going up, but we can certainly perform better. But Prof Wu showed that 
SDG 13, 14, 15 for Malaysia, it's stagnant. These three, the climate change, life below water, life on land, we are stagnating. So here is another point where researchers and academia and all of us, we need to buck up. Why is the environment degrading? Sorry to say, Malaysia is performing quite well in the economics, but once you go for development, at the moment we cannot decouple that when we develop, we destroy the environment. We jeopardize the natural resources. So we need to work harder in this section and academia and researcher need to do this. The other slide is, yeah, we learn through the episode of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, as you can see, the uh, diagram before and after MCO for the quality of air, it improves. And also we had been reading in the mass media uh, and various reports that the environment are getting better uh, during the MCO and still a bit better now, just when the economy opens up again. But this is where we need to behave. Yesterday, uh, through my group, the AACB, the group that is looking at the aspects of uh, awareness, advocacy, and capacity building. Interesting that Dr. Zunika raised the issue, the six issues, uh, you know, that we are facing in terms of trying to implement SDG better. Data, localization, funding, collaborate. Yeah, we, that's why. We are not collaborating. That's why we are performing badly for SDG 17. And then understanding that is awareness. So we need to work harder on that. And I believe we in the university, academia, and research field, we, we should support this. And then, and then in terms of reporting. So, so a few SDG, the whole world report that Malaysia did not report. So this is very worrying, particularly Tan Sri, and, and, and distinguished panelists and, and all who are listening. Malaysian universities, uh, particularly the top five research universities, we are in the top 1% of the world and we are improving our rankings by the day, by the year. But why certain reports for the SDG are not available? This is worrying. So I think we would like to offer ourselves to collaborate better with the government and the business sector and the community. Let's work better based on the quadruple helix, multiple helix, inter, you know, collaboration between disciplines, between sectors, let's work together. Universities of Malaysia are forever increasing in the rankings, including the private universities as well. We have about 70,000 lecturers and academics and nearly 1 million students. Two days ago, we read in the newspaper that students in universities, they also should be given certain tasks to help the country when they are pursuing through their formal curriculum duties or non-curricular activities to link up on certain projects with their community on the ground. The talent and the energy of the young people, we need to tap this sort of resources, very valuable resource. Okay, this is a scenario. I have only a few slides, Sanstri. My colleagues, uh, distinguished panelists have really helped me in putting up very detailed explanation just now. Okay, we, what this graph is trying to show like Prof Wu say, we cannot run away from development, but please, when we develop, try to think of how to zero rise, or if you can't make it zero, how to reduce the environmental risk. That means that's why United Nations always call upon all of us, think of DRR, disaster risk reduction. You see, COVID-19, that is a disaster in terms of human health. And when there is a disaster in terms of human health, you look where Malaysians behave. Quickly, we come together. Quickly, we have a good director general and all the government people and the National Security Council work together, briefing the rakyat every day without fear. So reporting, monitoring, be transparent to the rakyat and calling the rakyat, the people, work together, protect ourselves work together with the rest of the world as well. You see, Malaysia is being voted top 10 in terms of handling COVID-19. We hope we can do the same for environmental disaster. We have been listening to our some of our ministers and experts that 
in Malaysia, there are dead rivers, about 21, 23 dead rivers already among the hundreds of rivers. But to me, the incidents like the Sungai Kim Kim, Kuala Ko, and certain other areas, environmentally sensitive areas in Malaysia, can we try to think and do better and behave better? We cannot, certainly by looking at the graph on the left, we cannot carry on BAU, business as usual. No, business as usual, you are causing damage to the earth because we are exceeding the earth capacity. Business as usual, meaning we need two earth planets to support our current behavior. So what we are trying to do, and we hope we are with the rest of the world, we're trying to push the agenda of sustainability better to achieve the blue curve so that when we develop or do whatever, it should not exceed the earth capacity. And coming out from this COVID-19, slowly, slowly, you look at the four graphs on the right. It will depend upon the different combination between public health, which is expressed on the green graph as how we overcome the virus, economic intervention, which is development, and planetary intervention, which is looking at our impacts upon the environment. So, like Lavanya said, look at your carbon footprint, water footprint, ecological footprint. So in terms of education, like Tansri Raymond just mentioned, let's take a relook at the way we teach the young people, the next generation, not only good at memorizing and performing well in exams. No, we should take a relook. Bring into the classroom and bring them outside the classroom to be engaged on real problems and attach that to what they are learning in the classroom. Anyway, depending on business as usual, that is bad, that is the L shape, environment risk uh, is high for this one. But you can see the different shapes and explanation by looking at the way we handle in terms of intervention, um, in terms of public health, uh, economic intervention, and planetary invention. But what we want to achieve is the V bottom right d the graph d we, we we contain the virus we have strong economic programs if possible we can detach economic performance with energy requirement carbon footprint must come down water footprint must come down ecological footprint come down but economic still grow can we do it i would say like prof Wu, malaysia bullet our university clever people are plenty we need to pull this resource together, whether we come from public university or private university, we must come together and work together. We have clever people in terms of science and technology, but as Lavanya reminded us, it must be balanced. Dr. Zunika also said, we must be balanced. Social science, science and technology must come together. Maybe perhaps the, the last slide from me, Tansri. Yeah. You look at the two blue hands there. Local authorities on the upper right, academia here, because I'm representing academia this morning, the researcher. And then, but of course, not forgetting you, Dr. Zunika and friends. You are the government in the middle there. Lavanya and friends, you are there, the NGO. Uh, Tansri Raman, Tansri Jeffrey Chia, and all the business. We need each other here. We need to ensure circular economy will happen. Malaysian, Malaysia is one of the countries in the world which are well known with our beautiful policies. As you listen to Dr. Zunika just now, ever since the 60s and 70s, we were doing okay. Policies, beautiful. But if you look at the statistics of contract growth, uh, that makes us think and worry. Anyway, Coming back to this last slide. Professor, then, to do a minute, yeah? Two minutes more, please. Yes, beautiful. I'm last caught up also with your circular presentation. Yeah, circular economy, communication, advocacy must be better. We learn from pandemic, COVID-19, how the director general and the top people of the country communicate with the rakyat every day. We need to do the same for environmental disaster as well. In the middle, this is what we would like to promote, science-based decision-making and governance, particularly at the local level, as Dr. Zunika says. 
We, we observed yesterday in Malaysia, there are 171 districts, 153 local authorities. Each one of these, we need to figure out how to work with them better so that the rakyat will know and will think and behave better. And then we go for risk-based implementation. Prevent the risks, environmental risks, public health risks. And of course, there are the green and clean technologies. And forever, academia and research and university, we support at all the districts and local authority level through our research and capacity building. Local authorities, leaders, don't be scared. You are not alone. Look where are the nearest university, nearest business, NGO, and community leaders. We must work together for the sustainability of one and all. Thank you so much. Very much, uh, Professor. You know, uh, from all the panels, I get this message loud and clear that we cannot, as you say, Dr. Mazalin, do business as usual. The world has changed. The pandemic has taught us a lesson. What we need to do under decision making, under good governance, is to learn from it. Be humble. God has given us a signal, I personally believe. And if we don't react and respond favorably, we are really ruining ourselves. You talk about academia having to change, to do more research that is more relevant, particularly in regard to stunting, hunger, and the, the goals where we are weakest. Maybe that's the approach to take. And that's why I think uh, Dr. Mustafa, the government, having decided to postpone the five-year plan is a good thing because we can't think in the old mode. The new economic policy has to be revived, has to be improved so that there's inclusiveness there is competition, there is balance, and everybody has a place under the Malaysian sun. With that, would you agree, Malaysia Bole? Bole. No, Misty Bole. <laughs> but we must have, you see, that we can talk and preach, but the ministers must take the lead and make the right decision and have good governance. And I might say, as an ex PTD officer, it's not only academia and the rest of the public service, but particularly the PTD, the MCS officers, who had a tradition of great service, must carry on with that legacy. At local council level, is the red book we had on Atum Razak works wonders. But people must be involved. If they're not involved, they detach and they feel ignored and neglected. Sorry, I better. I might become a panelist. <laughs> <laughs> but now we have um, a Q and A. Uh, can I have the first question? Is to Dr. Zonika. Under pillar five on your slide, SDG thirteen on GHG reduction. Can you elaborate further on how the government aims to achieve the target of? 45% GHG reduction by 2030. Yeah. Can you get yeah. the answer in two minutes? Yeah. Thank you, um, Tansri, for the question. Uh, I will not take two minutes. Uh, GHG definitely is, is part of our policy, the reduction of carbon. And um, from uh, EPU perspective, uh, we put up strategies and and the key uh, ministries responsible for this initiative uh, is the Ministry of um, Environment, now the Ministry of Environment and Water. Uh, no doubt, um, it's not just the role of government. Uh, to ensure that the um, carbon uh, is reduced, but also um, the industry as well. So in terms of policy, we have put in the green um, procurement uh, as part of the strategy uh, to reduce the carbon uh, emission. And um, we are also putting in the uh, 
uh, one of the efforts that that is in the pipeline is in terms of reducing the um, uh, reviewing the um, environment act to look into uh, this matter uh, i hope that will answer the question that's we so but i would suggest that we are all the time learning the private sector the business sector will not move my personal view again unless there's a disincentive you must have incentives to reduce carbon and disincentives against raising and therefore there got to be strong penalties for destroying the earth uh, now from just rina to lavania in terms of implementation of nature-based solutions for climate change problem, what are the possibilities and success rate for it to be implemented in Malaysia? The kind of doubt I, I expressed just now. Thank you very much for the question. Well, we are a nature-rich country, right? If you look back, remember when we had the tsunami back in 2004, Boxing Day, the areas which had mangrove cover were actually the areas that were protected. There was a defense against nature's wrath. And this is what we mean by nature-based solutions, enabling nature to continue providing all these services to us. We are a forest-rich nation. We have, as I mentioned earlier, more than 50% forest cover. And we should really put in policies to ensure that this is maintained. We have made the pledge, we have still got it. Let us reap the benefits of this because actually with forest cover, we can do climate mitigation, climate adaptation, you know, food security, water security, protecting biodiversity, good for the economy, good for the people. So yes, there are many approaches and as a biodiverse rich country, we have actually- Sorry, Sorry. Carry yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's something that we really need to harness. I hope in the 12th Malaysia Plan we give strong focus for this actual benefit or attribute that we have, and we come up with frameworks which we can use to harness all this valuable resources that nature provides us, and not not waste it instead. Yeah. You know. Uh, in the days gone by, we used to be strong on planning and implementation. But today, the planning is still strong, but implementation, to my mind, is lacking. So in the new plan, we should really got to have strong emphasis on monitoring and implementation effectively. Otherwise, we'll be the old game. Yes. Now, the next or maybe final question to Professor Wu from Tony Go. Regarding the issue of localization, what can be done by the government to increase of awareness of sustainable development at the local level? Oh, that's a nice question. One thing that is, there can be no better promotion of sustainable development than then that actions are taken at the appropriate level. There are some actions that should be done at the federal level, like for example, the amount of uh, for, uh, forest cover for the whole country. But at the, in the, at, at the local level, a lot could be done in order to be effective. And one that would be uh, able to, to be done effectively is that the local governments have to be able to have the financial power to, sub, to support green investments in their states. Now, what we have now, what we have in Malaysia is that that is federal financial power. There's no such thing as local financial power. Every penny that the, the state has spent comes from the federal government. The only thing, the source of revenue they have is from land. 
and because the local government source of revenue is from land, they tend to over exploit the land because that's the only source of money for the local government. So they hand out uh, logging uh, concessions, possibly too liberally and without enough uh, monitoring. So if we do want local protection of uh, the, the forest in particular, we have to stop making land be the only source of revenue for the local government. And here is where I think uh, Malaysia in general would have more effective governance if everything is not decided in Putrajaya. Look at the bus system in Malaysia. The bus line in every city is decided in Putrajaya, including where you put the bus stop. And this was before Google Earth, you know. At least now Putrajaya can look at Google Earth and say, okay, the bus stop should be here. It still looks reasonable. So given the we like this the over centralization of government operations and of government finances. To wind down a bit. Because we started in a time of emergency where to fight the insurgency, everything had to be centralized. And also we had a shortage of human capital. Not enough people could know how to read uh, uh, an accounting. But what happened is Malaysia is now very educated. Every state can make more decisions. In other words, instead of having one large federal bureaucracy, we got to have some larger state bureaucracy. Yep, I agree. We all agree to that decentralize give people participation power to manage themselves because there is, it is also related to local council elections representation of the people by the people for the people but i like to come back to the point of you cannot make the revenue of the local government solely dependent on selling land when you have local election, they will put pressure on the federal government to provide more funding. I was in the treasury, I could see what was happening. And uh, it's very important to give them the resources to manage themselves. You're right, Prof. Now we got maybe the last question, and we have, I think, some bias. We gave it to Wong Chin Hua from our uh, university, uh, to Professor Maslin. Prof. Maslin, are the academia and local authorities substantially different in their roles from those in the middle in your last chart? If so, why is local authorities part of the government, in brackets, placed outside the government, just like what Prof. was saying, Prof. Wu? So, Prof. Maslin? Yeah, thank you, Tantri. No, the, the, the role uh, of each one of the members of the multiple helix, there are some common roles, there are differentiated roles. The, the point of the last slide which I shown just now is purposely to emphasize the points that my fellow distinguished panelists also had uh, voiced out earlier, that we expect local authority and local government to rise up to the challenge in this decade for action from 2020 to 2030. We want to see a braver and proactive, more proactive action from the local government, like Prof Wu had mentioned. Malaysia is so good at the top level, the Putrajaya level. All ministries, if we go to conferences, we keep meeting the same faces, same people. People already know and have been trained in SDG. But we need to focus now on the role of the local authority. There are some common roles, differentiated roles. Purposely, I pull out the two different colored academia and local authority, not to sideline the other three. No, because I'm representing academia today. We know that we had done good work. But as you all had been complaining in Malaysia, hey, university, your rankings keep going up top 1% of the world, but why we are still having this problem like Dr. Zunika mentioned, like the stunted growth and all. Ah, you see, we are doing good work, 
but we are not collaborating. That's why we are lousy in SDG 17. Why is Malaysia SDG? The only SDG indicator we get a arrow pointing downwards. Our partnership is lousy. So we must accept this fact. So in yesterday's dealing, we also try to figure out how to make the rakyat take ownership and ensure their effective participation. We would like to explore Tan Sri, the religious channel. 98% of the population of Malaysia have a religion and all religion require their believers to be stewards of the earth. Lavanya will be happy with this. So we need to figure out how to bring in two or three minute amount of information about SDG, about water, about stunted growth into the Friday sermons of the Muslim every Friday. How to get it into the Christian Sunday sermons at churches. There are hundreds of Buddhist temples throughout Malaysia, Sikh temples. So religious channel we need to explore. We need also to explore at the local level the development committee members of 16,000 villages scattered throughout Malaysia. We were observing South Korea. Why? They were lagging behind Malaysia in the 60s and early 70s. But you look at where South Korea is today. Part of the secret is the Samuel Undong Initiative. United Nations recognized this as the initiative whereby 34,000 villages of South Korea were empowered, especially by the government. Okay. Therefore, yeah, oh, I'm afraid I have to cut you here. Yeah, we must okay. enforce and help each other out at the local level. Thank you. Good. Looks as if there's strong consensus. So I'm afraid, much as we like to carry on, we have got, I got the guillotine on me. <laughs> so we'll have to wind down here. I want to say I've enjoyed this. I hope and I know lots of people listening to you all would have enjoyed your very good intervention. Thank you. I'm hoping that we'll get this report together by Jeffrey Sex Center, Jeffrey uh, Cha Institute, and us lead together, working together by ourselves before we can tell others to work together and come up with this report and then carry on with a series of maybe meetings and discussions or this kind of webinars. We'll see how it is, how successful it is. We carry on under Professor Wu's leadership too, because he's got a key role in all this in uh, Sunway. And uh, may I just put a little commercial to those who are interested in sustainability, and we all should be. We all should be. Take note that Sunway University offers a special program, a master's program on sustainability. Very few universities in the world do that. And this is the Center for the Sustainable Development in Kuala Lumpur and in New York and Paris. So we hope we'll build up the momentum to save the earth, to save ourselves and glorify the Creator's name through our religious work, our moral uh, issues that we teach, and most importantly, through the education system. Education, education, education. Yes. We've yes. gone the wrong track because of the wrong education. The whole world, not only Malaysia. With that, let me say, Makasi, thank you very much. Yes. Chinese style. Chinese <laughs> <laughs> style. Uh, we all Malaysians Makati uh, <laughs> and Malaysia Bully. Thank, Thank you. Malaysia Bully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Th